Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sustainable Buildings Canada webinar on COVID-19 ventilation upgrades. My name is Adam Jones. I'm going to be the, uh, the moderator and um, lead you through this uh, uh, presentation. Um, right now, I'm going to, uh, hopefully you all know what we're in for. This is the description of the, the webinar here. Um, we have three great uh, presenters who are going to stick around for a bit of a panel discussion after each of the presentations. Um, and uh, here's an agenda. So we're right now, here we are at 10 o'clock. Uh, my name's Adam Jones, as I already said. I'm gonna welcome and uh, introduce the topic. We've got a few things to cover, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, and then we're going to get right into uh, the, the big presentation with Josh Lewis, um, Kara Sloat, and Tony Capito. Um, and as you can see, they're going to each cover sort of a, a different angle on this topic um, and then come together for a panel discussion at the end and hopefully uh, you will have some questions for them. We've got some questions preset, but feel free at any time uh, to just type your questions into that question pane in the uh, GoToWebinar control box, and then uh, we'll collect all of those for the discussion at the end. If you have any questions um, throughout, feel free to just send me an email there, adamjones at sbcanada.org, and I will get you sorted out. We have another webinar coming up in March, uh, March 23rd. And the topic there is laneway houses, accessory dwelling units, and tiny homes. Uh, this is a, a topic that is becoming more and more popular and of great interest to the building industry from a wide variety of angles. And um, tiny houses themselves started out as a sort of way to escape the, the requirements of the building code by making portable houses that could kind of go anywhere as a sort of a secondary living unit. Um, and now they're being adopted into the building code, um, into planning regimens. Uh, we're seeing them um, touted as a way to solve uh, the housing stock problems that we're facing in the country, uh, perhaps to address affordable housing, um, definitely availability of housing. Um, so we're going to review sort of the the topic as a whole, what does it mean for these new types of buildings for builders, for planners, for property owners? Um, and we have two great case studies on uh, the development of a laneway house in Hamilton um, and then a tiny home development that's part of a bigger uh, affordable housing project in St. Thomas. Um, again, this is going to be a, a bit of a longer webinar where we're hoping to delve right into those case studies um, and then sort of blow that up and really figure out what it means for um, municipalities, for builders, for owners, everyone um, who's interested in these types of uh, buildings. Um, how can we how can we make it happen and what are the challenges that are, are already presenting themselves? So if you go to there, there's a link there, tinyurl.com slash SBC dash March 23, that will get you uh, to the registration page uh, for that webinar. And as always, I have to draw attention to our uh, research papers, our white papers at Sustainable Buildings Canada's website, sbcanada.org slash white dash papers. Um, we have sponsored a lot of research on a variety of sustainable building and sustainable architecture um, uh, topics. Uh, here are three that are somewhat related. Um, the Leading from the Future Pathways for Resilience in Ontario was written pre-COVID and it was uh, um, looking at um, more environmental-based shocks, um, but I would say that uh, COVID-19 is certainly an environmental shock, um, just from a sort of a, a different source than we were expecting, perhaps. Um, the other thing that Sustainable Buildings Canada did early on um, in the, the pandemic uh, was developed a rapid response um, uh, collection um, to help people uh, in the building industry address this. And now, our, at the time, we were thinking the big the big challenge is going to be, you know, how are we build, going to need to build temporary structures, um, you know, dealing with uh, the huge numbers of, of medical cases and how to manage that. Um, and obviously, this has turned into a sort of a different question now, um, where we're looking at how do you how do you get people um, out of their homes and back into a workplace. Um, and Statistics Canada has been looking at this as well. There's, uh, they've been doing some studies. Um, this particular study was done um, last year, so at the beginning of 2021, measuring how many people were working at home 
before the pandemic. So in 2016, only 4% of Canadians were working from home. And compare that to January 2021, where you have more than 30% uh, working from home. Now, what we're, what we're seeing now is people, obviously, businesses and, and workers, everyone is sort of looking about how's this going to look going back to work. And that's why we're here today is to just discuss the lessons that have been learned and how to best transition back into the, the buildings that we uh, work in and learn in um, and heal in, in the case of hospitals. Um, so that number there at the bottom, 24% of people are still expecting to work from home at least part time. Um, sorry, I, 20, 24% of the total time that employees are working, they think they would like to spend at home. So if I say that another way, people who were, who were surveyed um, are expecting to be in the office 75% of their working time. So 75% of your working time doesn't change the requirements of the building. The building still needs to be able to filter air and deliver fresh, clean air. And that's what the topic today is. Enercan has done a little bit of work on this as well. And so we've linked this. You can see this in your, um, your GoToMeeting app there. There should be a link for this PDF. And this is Enercan's uh, self-assessment uh, tool for HVAC operation. And so it's a voluntary self-assessment tool that you can just walk through. It's just a PDF that um, sort of has built-in questions. And as you answer them, it, um, it sort of works out what is the best way for you to manage the assets in your building and get to the best possible ventilation strategy. So I encourage everyone who's on the call to go take a look at that. It's certainly helpful and it will be sort of uh, you know, auxiliary knowledge to what we're going to um, hear today. Speaking of today, here's our, our presenters today. So we're going to start out with uh, Josh Lewis from Nerva Energy, and then Kara Sloat from Hammerslag and Jaffe, and then followed up with Anthony Capito, Tony, uh, from Mohawk College. Um, and it is a very, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, this presentation and the panel discussion afterward. Um, this is a really awesome group of people who've been working on these challenges throughout the pandemic. Um, and so we're gonna learn sort of best practices, what specifically um, has been done and what's working. And then um, Tony's gonna sort of follow this up with really good detailed lessons on what has been learned specifically at Mohawk. Um, and so we can learn a lot about the uh, schools and how schools are addressing the ventilation requirements of this. Um, COVID-19 driven um, upgrade. So with that, I'm going to invite Josh Lewis to join me here. And then let me just give Josh uh, presenter controls. Okay, should be good to go, Adam. There we are. Great, I'll hand it over. Thanks, Josh. Much appreciated. So uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Sustainable Buildings Canada today for hosting this webinar, uh, as well as uh, my appreciation to all the attendees who are online with us, as well as my uh, co-presenters. Uh, really looking forward to this today. So when COVID-19 became a pandemic in 2020, there was an immediate realization that the risk of transmission within buildings was likely very high due to the aerosolization of viral particles. So this forced building owners and operators to quickly implement strategies to improve indoor air quality and reduce the risk of disease transmission. However, many of the common strategies to improve indoor air quality can lead us down a path of reducing the energy efficiency and increasing the carbon emissions of our buildings. But for both our health and the future of the planet, we must achieve a balance between efficiency, air quality, and comfort. So when talking about the specifics of COVID-19 transmission, the ranked risk of vectors is as follows. Number one is certainly person-to-person -person transmission. Number two is airborne particles. And number three is contaminated surfaces. Now, these vectors are certainly not unique to the current pandemic. More commonly, they're also applied to seasonal flus and colds. While it's impossible to reduce the risk of disease spread to zero, as a society, we have implemented several specific actions to address each vector. So when we consider how to reduce risk, there is a certain order that should be followed. This is called the hierarchy of controls. It is advisable to follow the hierarchy as shown here for a fitness studio, 
rather than jumping immediately to what is perceived to be the easiest control measures. Well, you might ask yourself why. Well, it's because the effectiveness of the measure decreases as we go down the chart. Starting with elimination is the most effective control. If we can keep the virus outside the walls of this fitness studio, the risk of transmission is virtually zero. And you know we can do that through vaccinations and eradicating the virus in the general population. Now, next, we could substitute the studio environment for working out at home or outdoors with the instructor and other participants, joining either virtually or with social distance. That can keep the risk nearly zero or very low. Now, if we do want to get back inside the studio, engineering controls are the next line of defense, and that can involve a combination of measures to improve ventilation and isolate the people and the air they're breathing within the space. If the COVID-19 infection rates are high in the community where this fitness center is located, adding on a layer of administrative controls, including reducing indoor capacity, cleaning, and temperature checks is probably a good idea. And, last, and as a last resort, the use of personal protective equipment such as masks or gloves can be and should be really our final line of defense. Now, our webinar today is focused on the middle layer of this hierarchy, so engineering controls. So what are the key operational parameters that we must ensure our HVAC systems are set up to do and do well so that we can achieve a high level of indoor air quality? Well, they are filtration, dilution, and humidity. But at the same time, we have another competing priority, improving the energy efficiency and reducing greenhouse gas emissions in order to combat climate change. I'll be honest, up until this pandemic, the majority of energy conservation measures that were being implemented on HVAC systems were likely having a negative impact on indoor air quality. This is no one's fault. It's simply the end result of trying to achieve efficiency targets using traditional methods. I firmly believe that most people, including myself, fall every day into what I call the indoor air quality or IAQ trap. What is this trap? Well, if we walk into a building and it feels comfortable and we do not smell anything strange or offensive, then subconsciously our brain does not register any concerns about the health of the building. However, many studies have shown that nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, our senses are not finely tuned enough to detect most contaminants in the air that can impact our health and well-being. But before we jump into those details, let's lay some groundwork of what can happen if one or more of these parameters has not been effectively implemented. In the early days of the pandemic in China, specifically January 2020, there was an outbreak associated with an air conditioning system in a restaurant. As you can see on the diagram, patient zero was sitting at a table on one side of the dining room. On the wall, there was a split system air conditioning unit, which to the best of my knowledge had ineffective filtration, no dilution, as that type of setup typically does not include the mixing of any outdoor air, and there was very likely no purification or humidity control. So over the course of their meal, patient zero managed to infect at least eight other people on their side of the dining room. Yet, people in the other nearby tables did not get infected. The working theory that is being researched is that the AC unit created a recirculating air pattern around the tables near the wall, which distributed the aerosolized virus particles in a structured and measurable way. While the final conclusions for this outbreak have not yet been published, many other studies and accounts strongly suggest the root cause identified here is valid. And keep in mind, this is long before the even more transmissible Delta and Omicron variants were concerned. So we need to ensure that our HVAC systems are optimized for a healthy environment. Does that mean safety is number one? Yes, but the larger picture also forces us to include other goals in that assessment, such as reducing risk and liability, maintaining comfort, and managing and conserving energy use. It is important to note that in almost all cases, there is no single solution that can be applied to our systems in order to achieve these goals only a logical combination of changes and upgrades are likely to be successful. So there are key considerations that we must reflect upon when looking at the details of how typical energy costs having that negative impact on indoor air quality. Efficiency, first and foremost, is achieved as a result of tight control of temperature set points in our buildings, both when in the occupied and unoccupied or setback states. This measure is not known to have any negative impacts on indoor air quality. However, the next four are problem areas. They include only basic filtration, 
only operating fans when required, minimizing fresh air, and not controlling humidity levels, especially in the winter. If we want to benchmark against buildings that have above average indoor air quality, we need to look no farther than hospitals and other healthcare facilities. These types of facilities are mandated by codes and regulations to have HVAC systems that move large, constant volumes of air, and bring in a high percentage of fresh air into the building and have tight filtration and humidity control. Why? Well, because years and years of research and experience has shown the healthcare sector that this type of HVAC configuration greatly reduces the risk of healthcare acquired infections, such as pneumonia, staph, MRSA, sepsis, among others. However, virtually no other type of buildings are designed and constructed as healthcare facilities are, and if they were, their baseline energy consumption would be very, very high. The indoor air quality solutions for typical buildings must be different. But COVID-19 has been a trigger to force us to rethink about what HVAC systems should do. Allowing ourselves to fall into the IAQ trap is no longer acceptable. We need to effectively remove contaminants out of the air through a proper mix of filtration, dilution, and humidity. The benefits will extend well beyond the current situation we find ourselves in, including reducing the risk of spread of seasonal flus, colds, and other airborne pathogens, while also reducing the concentration of allergens as well as VOCs that are inevitably generated due to the materials we use in the construction of most buildings. So getting into some specifics, filtration is the first key operational parameter that must be optimized. Filters are present in virtually all HVAC systems, and they are designed to trap contaminants in their collectors. Their performance is critical, as they must be capable of cleaning the air as it is passing by. Minimum efficiency reporting value, commonly known as MERV, is a measurement scale designed in 1987 by ASHRAE to report the effectiveness of air filters in more detail than other ratings. There are three th key questions that I challenge all building operators to ask themselves. Do you know your current filter performance level? Do you know your current filter condition? And what is your strategy for changing filters? If, there's, if there are not clear answers to each of these questions, there is a potential that the indoor air quality in your facility is not optimal. Now, according to ASHRAE, filters with a MERV 13 rating are the minimum recommended for the effective capture of COVID-19. And they are also effective against a large range of other types of viruses, bacteria, and other contaminants. This is, however, an upgrade from the baseline state of most HVAC systems, which have typically in the past been equipped with pleated MERV uh, filters with a MERV 7 rating, or even worse, media-style filters, which only capture large debris and thus are practically useless against most contaminants. Thankfully, many pieces of HVAC equipment can utilize MERV 13 rated filters simply by swapping them out negating the need for any systematic changes. But this change comes at a cost. For filters with a higher MERV rating will need to be changed more option as they will naturally capture more contaminants in a shorter period of time. There's also the potential need for the system fan to work a bit harder to pull the air through the filters, creating an uptake in electricity usage. Uh, they can also impact airflow. So, you know, the, the, but these concerns can be minimized by using a, a measurement, specifically the differential pro pressure drop across the filter. The amount of pressure loss across the filter provides a clear indication of how dirty the filter is and also how much impact it is having on the amount of energy the fan is using to move the air. Electrostatic filters, which use an electrical charge to capture and hold contaminants, are a modern technology that should also be considered as they can have good performance with minimal pressure loss, although they do come at them with a much higher upfront cost. Either way, the most energy efficient, cost effective, and environmentally sustainable way to decide when to change or service your filter is to measure and monitor the differential pressure across it, then swap it out or clean it when it hits the manufacturer's recommended maximum value. Now, there has been a lot of talk since the pandemic started about HEPA filters. HEPA, also known as high efficiency particulate absorbing filters or high efficiency particulate arrestance filters, have equivalent MERV ratings between 17 to 20. This type of filter has typically been used in healthcare facilities and other buildings that have operations that are very sensitive to indoor air quality, including laboratories and manufacturing facilities with clean rooms. There are def they are definitely more effective at trapping contaminants, but due to their inherent tightness, the differential pressure drop across a HEPA filter is quite high, even when it's new. 
Therefore, most HVAC equipment cannot accept HEPA filters as they were not designed for it. And if installed, they would cause an unacceptable decrease in the system's airflow while simultaneously having the potential to increase electricity usage. Another more fundamental problem with HEPA filters as a standalone solution is that the, while there is no doubt they capture the vast majority of contaminants, the, the method by which they do that function requires contaminants to reach the filter. If the rate of air circulation within the building is too low, then the ability of the filters to quickly clean the air will be hampered. A real life example of this are portable filter carts with HEPA that have been installed in many schools in Ontario in order to respond to COVID-19. While the HEPA filter will capture the virus under most circumstances, the contaminated air has to travel from wherever it was generated in the classroom, say by a student sneezing, to the cart. If the filter cart does not have a large enough fan, then the effective air circulation rate would be too low to reduce the transmission risk by any appreciable value. ASHRAE recommends that if relying on filtration to clean the air, then at a minimum, all of the air within the volumetric space should be filtered at least four times per hour, but ideally six times per hour. In summary on this section, filtration is the first key operational parameter that must be optimized to create a healthy environment. Ensure that the installed filters have the right performance level, that there is a clearly defined strategy to know the current condition of the filters and when to change them, and that the HVAC system air circulation rate, or also known as the air change rate, is appropriate for the filters to be effective. The next key operational parameter is dilution. Dilution can be further broken down into two major strategies, keep the air moving and the introduction of fresh air into the building. Let's start with keeping the air moving. You know, keeping the air moving through buildings is key for a healthy environment. Stale, stagnant air can expose the building occupants to several risks, including airborne contaminants of all kinds, high CO2 levels due to the breathing process of the people in the space, and odors that act as irritants. And as discussed previously, good air circulation is critical for filters to perform properly. Also, it's not just about improving air flow. Some buildings, especially schools, were not even designed and constructed with mechanical ventilation systems. For example, in Toronto, in Toronto, at least 99 public schools have no mechanical system and rely on windows alone for air circulation. While that kind of design has not been acceptable within the building code for decades, our stock of school buildings in Ontario is quite aged, averaging 39.4 years old with many much older than that. These older buildings have likely always had less than perfect indoor air quality, which the current pandemic has now exposed. So specific actions that have been implemented to keep air moving usually start with ensuring that the HVAC system fan is running in fan on mode, meaning that during the hours of day when the building is occupied, the fans are running constantly to push air into and around the building. You might ask yourself, well, isn't that how most HVAC systems are supposed to work? Well, not necessarily. If you think about the furnace most of us have in our homes, it's often set to fan auto mode, which means that the fan only turns on when there's a call for heating or cooling. If the temperature set point has been satisfied, then the, then the fan stops, as does the air circulation. While that's efficient, it has a negative impact on indoor air quality. The typical way that the operation of the fan is changed and tracked through HVAC controls, also known as building automation systems. By installing, upgrading, or retrofitting the controls, the fan operation can be set up to provide the air circulation needed when the building is occupied, while also reducing energy waste by turning the fans off during unoccupied periods. The next thing to consider, uh, if the fan's running, is it running at its maximum capacity? To improve energy efficiency and HVAC systems have often been designed or upgraded to include variable speed drives, also known as variable frequency drives. These electronic systems allow the fan speed to be changed dynamically through manual or automatic intervention. In most cases, the drives have been set up on a schedule and configured with a limited maximum fan speed in order to reduce energy consumption. Unfortunately, during a pandemic, this strategy must be altered. Instead, we want to maximize fan speed, which maximizes air circulation of the existing system. When making this change, the original setting should be recorded and saved so that the parameters can be reset to their existing values once the situation which demands we prioritize indoor air quality over energy efficiency has passed. Lastly, for keeping the air moving, if the fan is on and it's set to its maximum speed, there is one more common part of HVAC systems that we must consider in order to keep the air moving effectively. It is not well known that virtually all ductwork systems leak. 
which impacts both indoor air quality and efficiency. ASHRAE actually states that 75% of commercial duct systems leak between 10 to 25% in their duct design manual, with reports from the field that real-world duct leakage rates are typically 10% higher, ranging from 20% to 35%. So why is there so much duct leakage? Well, the traditional methods of sealing ductwork from the outside with mastic, tape, and caulking are not perfect. Oftentimes, sealing is missed on hard to reach areas or lengthwise seams that have very little air leakage in a small section, but cumulatively add up to a significant amount of leakage over hundreds of linear feet of ductwork. Any air leaking from ductwork before it reaches the occupied areas of the building reduces air circulation rates and wastes energy, as the areas that it is leaking into, including ceilings, shafts, and mechanical spaces, are not designed for nor intended to be ventilated. If duct leakage is reduced, there will be an immediately more air circulation in the space that people occupy, improving indoor air quality and reducing the risk of disease transmission. Kara and Tony will be discussing this topic further, including some innovative solutions and real world results. To close out dilution, we also need to discuss the introduction of fresh air into the building. Replacing a percentage of the interior air with fresh outdoor air helps dilute and expel contaminants, which may be causing indoor air quality issues. If we brought 100% fresh air into a building all the time, the indoor air quality would be expected to be very, very good. However, from an energy efficiency point of view, the amount of energy needed to run at 100% outdoor air would be staggering for most buildings compared to their baseline. It has become more common in recent times for buildings to implement demand control ventilation, which is the building automation technology that continuously measures the concentrations of CO2 in the space, and based on that level, decides when to bring fresh air into the building. While that technology is mature and is proven to have a large beneficial impact to energy efficiency, it can reduce indoor air quality because oftentimes there can be long stretches of hours or even days where no fresh air is being introduced. During the current pandemic, it has been highly recommended by ASHRAE and others to disable demand control ventilation systems, especially during occupied hours, in order to provide a guaranteed volume of fresh air into the building to combat the aerosolized disease spread that we're all dealing with right now. The other related strategy for using fresh air strategically to create a healthy environment is called flushing, which involves setting up the HVAC system to bring in copious amounts of fresh air during a defined time, such as for two continuous hours after the building becomes unoccupied every day. This can be very effective at removing contaminants without necessarily having as large an impact on energy efficiency. Now, the inherent loss of energy efficiency when bringing fresh air into a building can be mitigated if the HVAC systems in the building are set up to recover heat or recover both heating and cooling from the inside air that is being exhausted to make room for the incoming fresh outdoor air. This is typically accomplished with systems that perform heat recovery ventilation, also known as HRVs, or energy recovery ventilation, also known as ERVs. HRV and ERV systems come in many different forms and utilize different types of heat exchange mechanisms from metallic cores and wheels to semi-permeable membranes and, and even paper. Their overall purpose is to capture the energy from the air leaving the building, both in the form of temperature, also known as sensible, and humidity, also known as latent, and then give up that energy to the air coming into the building with typical equipment efficiency ranging between 50 to 90%. By using these systems, more fresh air can be brought into the building with much less of an impact on the total energy usage. This has a positive impact on both the indoor and outdoor environments and can go a long way to improving indoor air quality without creating a massive spike in energy use or carbon emissions. The last key operational parameter for a healthy environment is humidity. As you can see on the graph, many years of research have clearly shown that the control of humidity levels in buildings is critical to maximizing indoor air quality. Whether talking about bacteria, viruses, fungi, mites, or other contaminants, they are all minimized in the air if the relative humidity level is kept between 40% to 60%. If possible, controlling to a tighter range of 40% to 50% will also keep mold growth at very low levels. Corollary to this, keeping humidity under control has also been shown to have many other indirect benefits, including reduced absenteeism, improved occupant mood, and increased productivity, 
all of which are likely the result of people within the building being healthier. In the past, the most common type of building to have year-round humidity control other than healthcare facilities were those containing class A or top tier office space. In, build, in our buildings in Canada, we typically do a good job of maintaining indoor humidity levels in the optimum range in the summertime. Because our air conditioning systems are primarily designed to dehumidify the air, as that is the largest portion of the cooling load, which has to be addressed in order for, for air conditioning to be effective in our climate. But in the winter, the air inside the vast majority of our buildings will have low humidity levels, typically between 10 to 30 percent. This is directly due to the condition of outdoor air in the wintertime. It is usually cold and dry, and when it is brought into the building, either through the HVAC system or by infiltration through the building envelope, it is heated up, and it makes it even drier in relative terms. From personal experience, I have seen the humidity level in an apartment building uh, in the corridor in the wintertime as low as 7%, which is just absolutely bone dry. But that is a direct result of the building doing what it was designed to do, bringing in large volumes of makeup air from outdoors, heating it up to 21 degrees Celsius and dumping into the hallway. Cold outdoor air becomes even, uh, cold outdoor dry air becomes even drier when you bring it into the building that way. The solution to wintertime humidity issues are straightforward, but it does have a penalty in terms of cost and energy. Humidity injection systems must be installed into our HVAC systems. In the past, these were typically steam-based, but many of those are now considered obsolete due to their high cost and extensive maintenance requirements, except for hospitals where they're still required by code. Newer humidity systems are typically based on either ultrasonic or high-pressure spray technologies. Regardless of what type is chosen, there will be an installation, energy, and maintenance costs associated with it that are above and beyond the requirements of the building code but we have to do this in order to create healthy and indoor environments. Finally, I'd just like to, you know, for everyone to keep in mind the, the carbon tax as well as we move forward. So if we think about what the carbon tax is, it's the market oriented solution that Canada has chosen in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, essentially making all fossil fuels and the derivatives from those fossil fuels more expensive over time, whether that be gasoline, diesel, the natural gas we use to heat our homes and everything else that flows out of that, jet fuel and everything else. So we're on a path now with the carbon tax. The Supreme Court of Canada has confirmed that the carbon tax is, is valid legislatively. So you can see on the chart here that the path that we're on in terms of dollars per ton of emissions up till 2030, and realistically, no one expects this to stop at 2030. Um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you talk to some economists, they think that in order to meet our climate change commitments, uh, we need to be somewhere between $300 to $500 a ton per, C per greenhouse gas emissions uh, by you know, 2040, 2045, if we have any chance of uh, getting to our net zero carbon economy by 2050. So, but what does that mean in terms of practical terms in terms of our buildings even in terms of our homes well what that translates into right now is that our cost of natural gas is increasing in ontario at a rate of approximately 13 percent per year you know there's not i mean we are certainly experiencing some high inflation right now across housing across food and, and some other sectors but not 13 percent there's very few, if, if nothing else in our, in our economic lives that increases at that rate per year. But the reality of it is the carbon tax is driving our natural gas that way. And, event, and, and that is without really any much commodity increase. So if we have commodity increases on top of that, it's gonna get real expensive real quick. The point I'm trying to make here is, is that are we still, you know, or are you still, you know, designing and specifying gas-fired equipment for your buildings? Because if you think about that, the average piece of commercial gas-fired equipment, like a boiler or like a rooftop unit, has a 20-year life, you're going to be, you know, your client or your building is still going to be paying for gas for that building in 2042, when the carbon tax is going to be, you know, at least double probably what you see here, if not more, you know. I really encourage people to to really take this to heart and and every decision we make. I've talked to some distributors of of gas fired equipment 
to expect within the next four to five years not to be selling any more gas-fired equipment because of the reality of where gas costs are going, because of the carbon tax. It is, it, and you start to look at the financial projections and it makes a lot more sense now to go to low gas or no gas solutions for our buildings when you consider the 20 year lifetime and where costs are going. So in summary, uh, in order to optimize our HVAC systems for a healthy environment, uh, you know, keep in mind, like I said in the beginning, there's no silver bullet. Instead, there is a menu of complementary options which need to be weighed against each other, whether we're attempting to improve an existing building or designing a new building. Filtration is certainly key to ensure contaminants are captured. Dilution, including keeping the air moving and introducing fresh air, ensures that the filtration is effective and that the air is changed over consistently. And humidity control is absolutely necessary for improving occupant health and well being. All of these are engineering controls that must be considered when elimination and substitution on the hierarchy cannot meet our needs. While implementing every option will likely result in superior indoor air quality, the reality is there is a simultaneous need to be energy efficient, which is not just about using less energy, but also reducing our carbon emissions as well. Uh, with that, I will now turn it over to Kara, who's gonna discuss the legislative environment, the health impacts of indoor air quality, and more details on various opportunities for keeping greenhouse gas emissions under control while not sacrificing indoor air quality. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys about this today, so I'm just going to roll right into it. Um, what do we need to do to keep our buildings properly ventilated under the law? Um, surprisingly, there are not a lot of requirements. Um, the Ontario Building Code refers to ASHRAE, the American Society for Heating, Ventilating and Air Conditioning and Refrigerating Engineers. Um, they, they have since dropped that. It's just ASHRAE now. Um, but they publish a variety of codes and standards, and their 62.1 Ventilation for Acceptable Indoor Air Quality is the standard referred to by the Ontario Building Code. 2010 is the reference point um, that's in the code. They do have several standards that have been published since. So for designers on the call, I recommend that you download and look at the 2019 version of the code, which can be reviewed for free on their website. Um, the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act requires that buildings be ventilated to control contaminants, but would refer back to ASHRAE for uh, specific requirements. Finally, some municipalities have legislation requiring that any engineered system be operated as designed. But in general, there is a very lightweight legislative environment. And this is how we've ended up with buildings that don't have ventilation systems and haven't had them installed. This is really more of a voluntary standard, even after two years of being in a pandemic situation. Uh, next slide. So given that the legislation isn't going to require us to add any specific um, ventilation measures, what do you look at when you're trying to figure out how to upgrade systems? Um, the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force has provided really solid guidance, um, but it is very technical. I've just shown you sort of a bunch of things that they've published. There's a lot of calculations and support for design engineers, so if that is your role, um, I highly recommend looking at their website. Uh, next slide. But for the more lay people uh, in the crowd, um, there are very straightforward, easy to read recommendations on the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health website. So I've provided a link to that um, on the slide. Their recommendations are uh, just like Josh said, number one, increase ventilation rates. If you don't have ventilation, add it. Number two, increase filter efficiency to at least MERV 13. It's worth knowing that there are uh, MERV 14, MERV 15 and MERV 16 filters available. The majority of HVAC systems can't overcome the static pressure, but if they can, those are available and will provide better performance. Finally, if you can't achieve either of those two measures, the last recommendation is to supplement with portable air cleaners. So what's backing up that recommendation? Why is uh, ventilation the first line of defense? Next slide reason is that in indoor environmental quality is 
only partially linked to uh, exposure to infection risk. Other aspects of indoor environmental quality that are addressed by fresh air brought in from outside include air quality. So carbon dioxide, volatile organics, formaldehyde, ozone, nitrous dioxide, um, all of these contaminants can build up inside an environment and should be diluted through the introduction of new fresh air. However, as we're doing that, we also introduce potential risks to student performance through other aspects of indoor environmental quality, specifically thermal comfort, acoustic comfort, and potentially even light and views as we're adding equipment outside the building. Acoustic comfort and thermal comfort, though, are incredibly important. In a 2016 New York City study of over 75,000 students, they found that test scores fell by 0.2% for every one degree uh, Fahrenheit temperature increase, which meant that the likelihood of failing a test increased by 13% if it was written in the middle of summer when the test room was 90 degrees Fahrenheit compared to a comfortable temperature. Um, and the same kind of relationship has been found when rooms are too cold. Um, test scores drop by up to 12%. So what that means is we can't rely on opening windows when it's very hot or very cold outside. Um, and fan noise from portable systems or in-room systems also have a negative relationship to student performance. Next slide. I've mentioned too cold and too hot. I want to emphasize that we are, um, as we try to address problems in our buildings, also facing a new climate reality. Um, by 2040, Ontario will look more like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Indiana, depending on what part of the province you're in. Uh, we will be seeing a requirement for air conditioning up to six months of the year. And although we have a wide portfolio of school buildings that currently operate without air conditioning, this may become untenable for learning environments. As a result, when we're looking at adding fresh air to buildings, we should be considering systems that will either directly provide air conditioning today or easily allow air conditioning to be retrofit. Next slide. What else do we know about indoor air quality and why ventilation is an excellent first step as opposed to filtration? We used to believe CO2 was just an indicator of poor air quality, but we have learned that it is in fact on its own also a contaminant of concern. Uh, Harvard in 2015 carried out a study that showed that at very normal CO2 concentrations in classrooms uh, or meeting rooms, decision-making indicators fall substantially. Um, people are less able to take initiative, um, use a breadth of approach, or create basic strategy. So you can see on this chart how performance is falling substantially at 2,500 ppm CO2 concentration um, and modestly at 1,000 ppm. How does that relate to what's happening in our classrooms today? Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, LNBL, oh, sorry. LNBL carried out uh, research in 2017 um, that showed that um, even though 2000 ppm feels to me as an engineer as a, an extreme amount of carbon dioxide, many of the classrooms they looked at were substantially higher than that throughout the course of the day. Um, you can see the medians were, uh, up around 1500 ppm and that there were some classrooms they tested that topped out at four or even 5000 ppm which is actually over the eight hour exposure limit um, for industrial exposure to co2 let alone um, you know health in a classroom setting so along the right hand side of this slide i'm just showing you some thresholds um, back before covid most mechanical engineers would have said that 800 ppm or even 1000 ppm would have been an acceptable target for indoor air quality. Um, as the pandemic has proceeded, 600 ppm has become a better target for guaranteeing that you've got enough fresh air in a space. Next slide. All right. 
CO2 isn't the only contaminant of concern. Other places that indoor contaminants come from include basically everything we bring into the building. Paints, coatings, sealants, glues, flooring, uh, ceilings, furniture, and cleaning products. Less toxic products are widely available and are generally cost competitive. Um, it is important to know that they may be different than the products that you're using today. It's really helpful to investigate this on an ongoing basis and slowly make substitutions, um, and also to verify that the uh, chemical compatibility in the new products matches or is able to work with what you've got going on today. This is particularly important if you're thinking of changing out both, uh, say, a floor tile and a flooring glue. Um, each one on their own would work with the normal um, systems, but you may need to choose specific compatible products to make sure that these sort of new formulations work together. Uh, certifications to make sure that you're getting um, healthy, child-friendly uh, materials every time that you're buying things are listed along the right-hand side of the screen. So there are a wide variety of uh, certification programs available. Next slide. Last point on air quality I want to make is that washrooms have been identified as a particular uh, source of COVID risk in buildings. It's important to keep them ventilated and also to keep sewer gas out of buildings. Um, each of the major outbreaks, both SARS-1 and SARS-2, um, have been associated with specific case studies in Hong Kong where high-rises had uh, uncontrolled spread within a single building that was traced back to sewer gas. Um, and hospitals have also seen sewage gas leaking through uncontrolled traps in plumbing, um, spreading a wide variety of uh, hospital-acquired infections. So the, the real kicker for this is that plumbing traps, I've got a little illustration on the bottom right, are, are mostly kept full of water by the use of fixtures. So when we left our buildings empty during the COVID pandemic, there's a higher possibility that lightly used fixtures in your building could have their plumbing traps dry. Then when we reoccupy, there is a higher risk for the occupants in the building. So how do we address this? We should make sure that electronic trap primers, which dump water down floor drains are working. Uh, manual trap primers, are hooked up to toilets, so you have to actually flush them to be able to get water into those traps. And if you identify a floor drain that is in an area where these measures are not working, you can buy physical trap seals, um, install them, and control risk in that way. Next slide. The last point I want to make about chemicals is that we still often don't know what we don't know with respect to the long-term health impacts of exposure to the thousands and thousands of new chemicals that we've invented in the last 50 years. I've got just a selection of advertisements for uh, formaldehyde fumigation, uh, lead, asbestos products that have all been sold as safe over the last 50 years. Bisphenol A, which was in um, drinking vessels, I'm sure all of us have owned, um, as we are considering new strategies for our buildings, and in particular, if you have a classroom you can't get fresh air to, and you're considering alternatives to HEPA filters, it's important to think about what kinds of chemicals you could be introducing into the space and what you know about the long-term safety for exposure for the people in this space. Um, we know that COVID exposure has immediate certain and known harms. So if it's not possible to add ventilation to a space, disinfection technologies are a sensible approach, but it's critical to review the evidence and find products that have a minimum associated risk, the most important of which are direct UVC exposure risks. So if you can actually see the light happening, um, that can be a risk to occupants. Um, and ozone emissions and formaldehyde emissions, which have been associated with certain air purification technologies. All right, finally, next slide. So looking at all of these uh, elements of air quality together, um, we can create an ideal classroom that has um, good acoustics, healthy furnishings, appropriate light, appropriate ventilation, appropriate access to uh, outside air. 
And if you want to learn more about how to create these spaces in your buildings, the Collaborative for High Performance Schools has really good guidelines on details of how to design these. All right, I'm gonna move into uh, how much fresh air is required for classrooms. So um, we're talking about fresh air. What If your building doesn't have fresh air today, or if you're trying to understand rule of thumb, whether you have enough, um, you're not alone. Uh, 2013 study found that 85% of California schools, which had recently replaced their HVAC systems, so within the last three years, still didn't meet code ventilation requirements. And that study was also used to look at the health impacts of uh, those poor designs. They did find negative health impacts. So for a typical elementary school, if you run an ASHRAE calculation, you'll need somewhere between 8,500 to 10,000 CFM of fresh air, um, or about 350 CFM for each classroom. And that gets you to three air changes per hour, which is the, the bare minimum of fresh air. For those listening on the call, you may have heard um, five or six air changes per hour being targeted. Um, that is usually referring to the total amount of air changes, so including both recirculated air and mixed in fresh air. Um, this 350 CFM number is only fresh air, so only the stuff coming in from outside. And then for a typical secondary school, somewhere between 26,000 to three, uh, 30,000. Next slide. As you're considering how to add outdoor air capacity to a building, it's important to know that the Ontario Building Code has introduced mandatory compliance with air intake at separation distances. I've shown the whole table down on the bottom right hand side of this slide, but things you need to avoid are cooling tower exhausts, driveways, garages, garbage storage, plumbing vents, um, thoroughfares, truck loading areas. So this will keep your building healthy. It'll also keep your installation code compliant. Next slide. We talked about humidification in Josh's presentation. Um, we've known for years that humidity is healthy, but recent research has shown that it is even more important than we thought. Um, a study by a doctor named Stephanie Taylor out of the Harvard um, I think it's School of Public Health showed that in a review of all factors they could identify in a hospital uh, that impacted hospital acquired infections, um, the average humidity level was the number one variable that determined um, whether or not people would get sick. It had the highest influence and it reduced hospital acquired infections by over half when it was between 40 and 60 percent RH. Um, they were so surprised that they repeated the study in a daycare and they got very similar results, over half in reduction of uh, absences by students in the humidified half of the daycare. Um, they think that this is three uh, for three reasons. As you can see in the bottom left-hand side of this slide, um, it's because it keeps the particles in the air um, from floating for a long period of time. It actually reduces the survival time that the virus um, can survive in the air and it keeps our respiratory systems healthier and allows them to protect us more efficiently. Next slide. So Josh mentioned that modern technologies for humidification um, tend to veer away from traditional steam electro generation, which is very high cost. I want to um, improve or, or uh, continue that conversation and note that uh, because most schools only operate in the winter, ultrasonic or mist humidification is both known as adiabatic humidification technologies are using the building's main heating system to make up for the energy that's required to evaporate that air. So when you add the humidity to the airstream, it actually will lower the temperature and then it has to be brought back up by your main building system. So the consumption of uh, energy by the system is much lower, um, but 
overall its impact on your energy use is about half, a little less than half of what it would be if you had directly generated steam. However, the systems do require more maintenance than a steam generator to keep them safe. Um, and they require that the water that is going into the systems be treated. So from an overall operating cost perspective, you may find that there, depending on the size of your facility, is still a role for electrode steam generation. Electrode steam generation would also have a very low carbon uh, impact, whereas gas steam generation will, uh, as Josh noted, become more and more expensive to operate from 2020 to 2030. Um, your choice of which system to use may finally be uh, related to what physical space is available in your system. So using steam can allow you to have a much shorter absorption distance inside a duct um, and can potentially allow the system to be installed in more places than an ultrasonic or a steam mist humidifier could be used. So don't write off any of these technologies if you are considering a retrofit. All right. My last topic, the second last topic, is air distribution. So how do we think about how we get fresh air to students in buildings? Next slide. Exhaled thermal plumes um, are a really interesting uh, part of understanding how people interact with buildings, um, both with and without masks. So when we talk, breathe, interact in a space, the air that we breathe comes out of our mouths and noses but it's warmer than the uh, surrounding air. So you can see in this thermal imaging that there is a constant stream of warm air that's rising off the top of somebody's head. If they're wearing a mask, almost all of the air that they're exhaling ends up rising directly over their head instead of uh, heading out towards the other occupants in the space. So this is an interesting property that we can leverage to create safer spaces. Next slide. ASHRAE knows about this. So in that ASHRAE 62.1 standard we discussed earlier, there's actually a correction factor for how air is being distributed in the space that takes into account how much of the air that you're putting into the space will end up in the breathing zone and how effectively the contaminants that people are breathing out are going to be removed from the space. So um, some interesting takeaways. A normal well-mixed systems, that's like your standard overhead distribution with overhead return, in the summertime is sort of a standard performing system. So the calculation that comes out of ASHRAE uh, is exactly how much air you need. In the winter, however, if you're supplying air that's more than 15 degrees warmer than the room, you actually need 25% more air to get the same air quality levels. If you have a supply and return on the same side of the room, it gets even worse. You can potentially have to double the amount of air to be able to get the same level of air quality. So you can't just put air into a room and hope that it's going to get into the breathing zone to the place where people are actually needing the fresh air. It's important to have a really careful strategy on how that air is distributed within the space. So there are a couple of changes we can make that will improve the systems. Next slide. One potential strategy that could work for some of Ontario's school building stock um, could apply to buildings that have both overhead heating and perimeter heating. So if you currently have a system that uh, distributes air at over 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than space temperatures, and you have a perimeter system that you can control the temperature on, if you can change your control strategy to use the perimeter as your primary source of heat and reduce the supply air temperature, you'll get substantially better air quality. So either a 25% reduction in the fresh air required, which would give you operational savings, or 25% improved air quality to help control your risk in a pandemic. Next slide. Uh, and click. So these are high induction diffusers. Um, this is a technology that uh, takes the air coming from the ceiling and mixes it more fully into the space. Um, so this can allow you to use warmer air 
and still get really high quality um, air into the breathing zone. So these um, are rated to create about a uh, 13% reduction in uh, the fresh air that's required in the summer and up to 27% less in the winter. Again, um, that's saying if you want the same level of air quality. So these are quite expensive, but there are more and more uh, suppliers coming out every day. For displacement ventilation, um, this is the last and most interesting solution and more applicable to new buildings. If you have at least nine foot ceilings, ideally 10, you can add air at the bottom of the space instead of at the top and take advantage of that uh, effect that we saw where we saw people have these like plumes coming off the tops of their heads. So this is a technology where we add very slow moving air to the bottom of a space and allow that thermal plume to carry the contaminants away from people's breathing zones. So this can create as much as a uh, 33 to 46% reduction of fresh air, depending on the conditions, particularly in your double height spaces. So what does this actually look like in application? Uh, next slide. There is a school district in uh, Kansas that has tried this both in their new and existing schools, but in retrofit, they have seen 15 to 30% energy savings when they have switched from overhead to uh, displacement ventilation. Uh, this quote, I think, is really interesting. You know, improved air quality that is noticeable, dramatically better, and a 20% savings in energy costs. Um, from a first cost standpoint, they find that it's cheaper than dual duct VAV, comparable to single duct VAV. Their standard has changed, and they want to know why anyone would do anything else. Um, and as someone who has spent time in displacement ventilation buildings, I, I have to admit that I've had a very similar uh, instinct. You, you feel more alert, you actually can learn. Even when something seems like it's a, a presentation that otherwise might have put me to sleep, I realized that I, I might just have been suffering from poor air quality. So what does displacement ventilation look like in a building? Um, next slide. This just shows you some of the different diffusers. So when I say low, low, slow air, um, this diffuser type mounts near the floor and creates a wall of cool air at the bottom of the breathing zone so that uh, students are sitting in, in a pool of, of fresh air. Um, my last slide on this topic um, shows another example of uh, retrofit of displacement ventilation. Um, I've got these case studies primarily because as a mechanical engineer, I was unaware that you could retrofit this effectively into buildings, but there are a number of examples of people um, cost effectively creating this solution in previously overhead distributed buildings. All right, next slide. You saw this example in Josh's presentation. Um, I've brought it back into the table. So he has the cool 3D view um, of this restaurant's uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 study, I want to note that um, as you're thinking about your classroom air distribution, it's helpful to think how many students' air is going to flow over somebody else before it has to leave a room. So next slide. There is an interesting uh, low-tech uh, ducted exhaust solution that has been tested in Germany. Um, where they, uh, instead of ducting supply air um, around a room, put the supply air in in one spot, but removed contaminants over each student. So this was intended to be used with operable windows. The climate there is quite mild, um, but they were able to, for less than $250, um, add an extraction fan that removed contaminants at source. So this particular solution may not be applicable in Canadian buildings. These are combustible materials. These might get in the way of sprinklers. But the concept of ducting your exhaust, getting more contaminants out right near the place where they were generated, I think is really helpful. Um, so if you have the choice as a designer or as an owner to consider supply ductwork versus exhaust ductwork, um, don't discount the value of removing contaminants at source. All right, 
My last slides have to do with the energy impacts of all of these choices. So how do we make sure that as we add ventilation, we're not adding too much cost? Um, if you have an already ventilated building, we estimate that you're probably using 15 to 25% of your overall energy use for heating and fans. Um, so that could be somewhere in the range of $10,000 uh, for code compliant ventilation in a school. But maybe you don't already have ventilation. So this could be a potentially a substantial increased financial uh, burden on your building. How do we re reduce that? Next slide. One option is to reduce the impact of uh, pressure drops in the system. So you can reduce the static pressure drop through high performance filters by using electrostatic technology. So these filters are an active solution that loads more slowly than a typical filter. So you have less costs for filter changes, less maintenance cost for changing filters, and a less uh, maintenance burden as well as lower energy costs. Uh, next slide. So demand control ventilation was during the early part of the pandemic recommended to be entirely disabled, but with CO2 monitoring in classrooms and careful management, it can be effective to stage controls um, such that you flush a building entirely before you shut it down for the day and then turn on ventilation only as spaces are occupied and then leave them ventilated till the end of the day. Um, and once the pandemic is over, this uh, measure would then turn off when a space has people leaving it. So you're only ventilating the spaces you actually need. Um, of the 8,500 CFM that I said you typically need for a elementary school, it's worth noting that there's only 450 CFM worth of actual occupant requirement in the space. So um, you have about double the total requirement because not everybody is in every space at once. So demand control ventilation could be pretty important for energy savings. Uh, next slide. Josh did a great job of describing uh, ERVs and how they work. Um, I wanted to note there's two major types, wheels and aluminum reversing cores. Aluminum reversing cores are a newer technology, but they're really evolving and there are many new suppliers in the Canadian market. Um, the thing that's really neat about them is that they are incredibly efficient in heating only, which is very applicable to schools. We're very lightly occupied in the summertime, so the fact that we don't do good humidity control, wheels are excellent at humidity removal, um, whereas aluminum cores, pretty good at humidity in the winter, um, but require higher air conditioning costs in the summer because our buildings are lightly occupied in the summer, these are a really good solution for our buildings. Next slide. Um, the most important thing I want you to leave with if you are considering a retrofit of a building um, is that ERVs only work if you are actually recovering energy from your exhaust streams in your building. So on the right side of the slide, I'm showing a way that these are often deployed in buildings, which is that we have a bunch of exhaust fans in your bathrooms and your IT rooms and your electrical rooms, and they're exhausting air from the building. And then you bring separate fresh air into a classroom and then additional exhaust air out of that classroom through an energy recovery ventilator. If this is how your building is built today and operating, then you're still losing all the energy through those exhaust fans. You're not recovering the energy through the exhaust fans, you're actually just bringing additional exhaust air out of the building. So you're not gonna get the energy savings, even though you are going to temper the air coming into your HVAC system. So it's really, really important as you're considering these retrofits to try and find a nearby location where air is being uh, exhausted from the building and try and recover energy from that source. If you have central air handlers, that's great. You can add this there, um, but taking the additional budget to duct real life real required exhaust back to the unit is critical all right next slide um, you can also reduce your air volumes by doing duct sealing and we're going to hear more about that in the next section but it's got about a 5.3 median payback 5.3 year median payback um, next slide so 
I want to show you now in a waterfall graph how all of these energy savings measures will add together to reduce the impact that ventilation has on your overall operating costs. The first and most important thing that you'll do is turn off ventilation systems when the building is unoccupied. I've run these numbers assuming a 12-hour operation period, so a two-hour pre- and post-occupancy flush to comply with COVID guidelines. But still, if you left them on overnight, you're going to see 62% more energy use um, than if you turn things off. So this is the most important thing you can do. So my next slide um, assumes that you've turned the systems off. So I'm starting from that lower, I'm only running at 12 hour a day um, point. So I've run numbers for a typical elementary school to show you the magnitude of the savings for each of the things that I've discussed. Displacement ventilation would give you 27% savings over a standard overhead system. Adding demand control, potentially 29% savings. Energy recovery ventilation systems, 23% savings over the, uh, the demand control. And then if you were to buy a higher performance energy recovery ventilator, like that aluminum core technology, an additional 11%. So once you've done all of those things, you've really dialed down the amount of energy that is required to provide this really high performance environment for students, um, as well as reducing carbon emissions by 95%. So what does this mean for you if you own a building that doesn't have ventilation right now? Uh, next slide. So I tried running the numbers, assuming that the only impact of energy for a building was infiltration that was related to um, the air that you were exhausting through washrooms, kitchens, that kinds of stuff. So assuming that you have about a third as much um, air moving through the space that I would expect and no fan energy associated with ventilation. So in that case, if you just added fresh air, no other mitigation technologies, you'd see a tripling in your energy use. But if you implement all of these other strategies, you can still come out with a building that saves 67% of the energy that you were using before for air movement through the space and has no net increased cost. Okay. Final comment, opening windows is not recommended for peak of summer and peak of winter, but you can get really good performance out of a building if it's designed for proper cross ventilation in the shoulder seasons. Uh, York University has a beautiful building, the Computer Science Building, which the last time I looked in 2016, this was built in 2004, it was still their lowest energy using building per square foot on the whole campus. Um, and the way it's accomplishing that is by having um, passive energy um, use through uh, fans that can draw energy or draw air into the building from outside when the temperatures are appropriate and having a high level exhaust you can see they have this little tower um, that draws air through the building into atriums and then out of the top of the building um, and these cross sections you can see at the bottom of the screen are typical for almost any high performance building um, having a way to get a high level exhaust in a classroom is critical and it can also combine with daylighting strategies to create an overall um, better environment for students and lower operating cost. So I, I recommend if you are a person working on new schools or considering major retrofits, trying to think about how you could introduce these high level exhausts into your existing building. Nice. Before leaving you, is that's a big concept, I'm gonna give you an easy one. Um, double height spaces can have better air movement simply by adding fans. Um, you've got a lot of unbreathed air up at the top. And so if you don't have displacement ventilation, um, in the winter time, you'll get both energy savings and better air quality overall by moving that air at the top of the space back down to the bottom. So these fans um, are available with simple incentives and can provide up to 30% energy savings in buildings. Um, if you want to learn more about energy savings for schools, um, ASHRAE has published a number of energy efficiency guidelines. Um, these books, uh, there's one for 50% energy savings and one for zero energy. They each have lists and lists of strategies for different climate zones 
that are uh, described with details, very careful implementation guidelines, um, sample lighting layouts. So um, if you would like more inspiration on how to improve your buildings, highly recommended as a resource. And with that, I will hand over to our next presenter. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Kara. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, as a reminder, my name is Tony Capito, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the Research Chair of Sustainable Building Technologies at Mohawk College. Uh, prior to my current uh, position with Mohawk, I managed the facilities for both Hamilton District School Boards as the Superintendent of Facilities and ran the physical plants at McMaster University and Mohawk College. So I can appreciate the challenges of improving indoor air quality and increasing ventilation performance. And you heard quite a bit about that from Josh and Kara. Uh, next slide. One of the uh, things I'd like to do is uh, share a, a quote from a colleague of ours, Peter Varga, who likened uh, buildings to uh, the human anatomy where they need to breathe, they need to function optimally, and um, ensuring that the building works the way it should uh, is an important part of how the building will perform. And uh, I think that's a great analogy and I, I thank him for sharing that with us. Uh, next slide. The, uh, I think it's important to note, uh, Josh mentioned about the number of schools in, in Toronto District School Board that uh, are not ventilated, but uh, effectively across the province, almost 30% of the schools are not mechanically ventilated. And, and the ones that are, uh, the systems are older because of the age, median age of close to 40 years. In many cases, uh, having maintained several hundred schools in my role uh, as the uh, superintendent of facilities, where you were challenged with budgets, maintenance cuts, and, and many other things, uh, there was an under-maintained physical plant there that uh, was a struggle for everyone. And uh, there were always standards that you're trying to achieve, but original standards are now, uh, or the original standards of the design of those buildings are certainly obsolete and uh, are, are difficult for everyone when something like a pandemic hits. So we know that there's, uh, we cannot simply tear down schools and rebuild them. There has to be some other processes to help out. Many, there were many techniques identified, uh, but I'll share a few of them here and we'll um, see how we can move forward with that. Next slide. One of the key strategies, and certainly Kara uh, noted this, is that we want to get fresh air into classrooms. Uh, that is a challenge, uh, certainly with our uh, weather uh, demographics here, where it's not easy to do in the winter because uh, either it's too cold or in many cases, windows don't open properly or don't open at all. I worked in uh, many facilities where they were uh, where they were requested to be uh, shut tight. and there are also uh, challenges with how to do that in, in some type of a financial um, sane way because it can be very expensive to put in a, a formal system into an unventilated school. But what many are doing is putting in unit ventilators. You can see an example of one there. Uh, it's, it's a relatively straightforward way of, of improving the ventilation in a particular classroom or a larger room uh, and, and very straight, straightforward way to do it and be very effective at the same time. Next slide. One of the uh, difficulties that I've experienced in many of the schools, and I'll reiterate this as we move forward in other slides, is the challenges with proper maintenance of filters in schools in particular, <clears throat> and other buildings as well. Uh, Josh uh, went over a lot of detail about filters, but you can see uh, challenges across the board. Uh, difficulties with uh, not having a good schedule to maintain and replace dirty filters. You get pressure challenges uh, and inappropriate filters that are used and they can often collapse, which is, makes them virtually uh, uh, ineffective at all. And then you get complete misapplications of filters. Uh, and that's uh, maybe a rare example, but certainly an example of what you could see in any particular building where someone jury rigs something to try and improve some filtration performance. Next slide. Uh, humidification was talked about and, and in many schools I've experienced uh, humidification systems where there are some challenges. Uh, they're often inappropriately uh, engineered for the building where they are installed 
often they're they're not sized correctly, and you have a lot of difficulties with ongoing maintenance. Uh, having had these systems in many schools, my experience has been, for the most part, many of them have been abandoned, as opposed to uh, improved uh, uh, performance by regular maintenance or otherwise. Some are working, but many are not. And this helps paint the context of what I'm going to be talking about. So you have issues with humidification, filtration, and, and some other system uh, challenges because of the ventilation issues. And that leads me to you know what we'll be talking about very, very shortly. Next slide. Uh, we, we've been, at, at Mohawk College, we've been very fortunate to work on a uh, very active program with a number of schools across Ontario, in particular close to Ontario, uh, Mohawk College, which is in the Hamilton area, of course, and the 10 local district school boards around there, but that is now expanded to across the province with uh, many of the school districts that are mentioned right there, and we now have over 320 participating schools in a program that is working on ventilation improvements for schools. And uh, I've been in, uh, personally involved in this program since the inception, and uh, we're the official research and, and validation partner working with students and others to help with uh, ensuring that the performance of these buildings improves. And we're uh, pleased to have uh, an opportunity to work with these school districts see if we can impact their absenteeism. We know that with better ventilation and better technology, uh, we can improve absenteeism, particularly as it relates to the pandemic. But prior to all that, there were still challenges with colds and flus and everything else. So we're doing some third-party validation and verification using uh, technology and uh, getting and sorting the data out. Uh, currently, we're monitoring three schools, uh, five classrooms and three schools at, in the Grand Erie District School Board, and we're seeing um, uh, some significant ongoing uh, air quality um, data and performance that kind of mimics some of the issues that it certainly CARA identified as it relates to CO2 and some other things as well. So it's important to check on this, and uh, with some technology that I'll talk about, CARA mentioned about um, Aero seal or duct sealing. Uh, there's some opportunity here to improve ventilation and uh, performance as well. Next slide. One of the uh, things we know about a building, and, and in particular, uh, the infrastructure of a lot of the duct work in buildings was really fairly unknown territory for many. Uh, the reality is, its facilities managers were trained to look at the performance of our equipment and the state of our coils and diffusers, however, the long stretch of ductwork infrastructure connecting these two systems uh, typically um, falls outside of the traditional scope of the facility maintenance. Usually most of it's hidden and you don't see it, but there's, we're discovering a lot of challenges related to the, um, uh, the ductwork. And that can relate to uh, what we know is a sick building syndrome, uh, recirculation of uh, nasties, of microbials, viruses, bacteria. There's certainly energy loss, which is an important piece right now from a dollar point, uh, perspective. And that relates to the inability to start approaching targets for greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And that's that's a, a going to be a complicating factor over the next few years. So what are we seeing in some of our schools? Um, the top left, it's interesting, I was at a school in, in uh, <clears throat> Ramford area where uh, a relatively new air handler was put on the roof about three years ago. Uh, and the installer of the air handler um, forgot that he had to connect to the ductwork, which was three feet below and through the roof assembly and left that. And, uh, it, and that affected needless to say some of the performance that was going on within the building. Uh, you're also, if you were to go above and look at your ductwork, particularly, um, in schools where they're covered up. You'll see over the years, there's uh, ongoing issues related to maintenance, repairs, uh, ex expansions, extensions, or otherwise in the building that have left the ductwork in a compromised state. And all this uh, affects the performance, as I mentioned earlier. And these are some of the things that need to be repaired. In, in one school that I, that I was uh, witnessing, there were four classrooms in a row where a contractor had gone in a, a year or two before 
and put in new lay-in ceiling tiles uh, to help with the uh, uh, a new lighting grid that was put in and everything else. What we determined was that the diffusers that were in the uh, ceiling grid, he installed or reinstalled the diffuser, but didn't reconnect the diffuser to the ductwork up above, thinking that was someone else's job. So you see all sorts of different things that happen over a period of time, particularly in schools, and that can be a challenge. Next, next slide. Uh, so there, there's uh, you know some importance to look at the ductwork leakage and the, and the issues that uh, relate to that. And when that happens, you improve the airflow, and I'll show you some um, uh, significant numbers in a, in a minute. But that also improves the health and safety. We talked about uh, the need for fresh air. And if you are getting any type of fresh air through a ventilated system and it's leaking out throughout the ductwork that isn't properly maintained, and we're seeing that in, in larger numbers, um, that's a problem. You also get better efficiency, of course, and we'll talk about those results here. And I just want to reiterate too, we were seeing problems with the ductwork infrastructure, not only in older facilities, but in newer facilities as well. So this wasn't just about older facilities. So here's some of the results of some school districts that we visited. Um, and, and here's a, a prime example of what we were seeing in, in airflow improvements when we're looking at particular air handling units or in um, heat recovery units uh, with some good engineering and some um, review and auditing. We're seeing some of the uh, significant improvements in airflow without having to put in new equipment, just simply putting in uh, uh, first of all, preparing problems with the ductwork and then adding in uh, AeroSeal technology, which is an aerosolized uh, polymer that is brought into the ductwork under, uh, uh, under specific conditions and safely and uh, doing so without obstructing the actual uh, time in the school. It's usually done after hours. And we're seeing those types of improvements in, in the airflow. So that's uh, something that uh, is important to see. When you're looking at how that relates to the number of diffusers uh, across um, the, the spectrum of the air handling unit and, and the ductwork that goes with it, and particularly in some cases the number of classrooms, you're seeing, uh, you know, it, it can significantly make airflow improvements, um, in some cases drastic. 70% you're seeing in one case here, close to 20% in another, and same thing here, so close to 20 in this case, uh, just over 55. So those are significant improvements, and that's just trying to uh, mimic or model the uh, design airflow that was required for the building. And uh, we're seeing that in some of the research and validation we're doing. Here's some examples of uh, a couple of school districts that uh, we have been working with. Uh, you're seeing that one example in, in Grand Area, the 72% of the school that I was at in particular, and uh, uh, you know, told you about the problems we saw with the air handler on the roof and, and some of the diffusers. And these are just typical examples of what we're seeing across this, across the spectrum. So on average, uh, in that in that board and some others, Trillium and uh, North North District Board, you're seeing some uh, significant changes and improvements in airflow averaging uh, over 36 percent so that's excellent and, and again without having to change mechanical systems but just simply improving the duct work and, and uh, some repairs that are much needed repairs that are necessary across the uh, ventilation system one one of the things that is important to, to know uh, and was mentioned earlier that there is some good engineering and auditing that is done in this particular process uh, with Nerva Energy in this example. And what we're uh, pleased to say is that they were able to um, have post airflow CFMs that are approaching the design airflow. That, that was important. And in all these particular schools, it was, it, it was a result of uh, poor uh, duct work and ventilation systems that needed repairs, significant airflow improvements. That translates into uh, energy savings, and Kara noted some of that in, in her research. But certainly, uh, we're seeing some good electrical savings and gas savings, which easily easily translate into the greenhouse gas reduction requirements that uh, are important and need to be tracked um, as we try and meet our targets as institutions across Ontario. 
So we're, we're looking at uh, good improvements in energy bills, uh, reasonable uh, ROIs, if that um, needs to be translated. Certainly carbon reduction is an important piece. And as we try and reach those 2030 goals, uh, this is a good step in the right direction. By improving the uh, ventilation through the uh, ductwork, uh, we can, in some cases, avoid un some unnecessary, uh, unnecessary capital costs. It's not uncommon to have to replace uh, rooftop air handling units and other systems. If the ductwork is properly sealed, you could probably and likely downsize some of your mechanical systems, which is a significant cost savings in itself. So that's an important piece. And with some good uh, maintenance and repair that we're talking about here, it extends the life of your ventilation system and starts to allow you to have a develop a proper maintenance schedule that will ensure that this doesn't happen again over the next uh, few decades. One of the things that uh, this program, which we called Cleaner Air for Schools, is doing, we're improving the safety of the schools, uh, with, again, better fresh air and environments. Uh, we're seeing some good quantitative data that's coming out of this that is showing that the technologies used, including some air purification technologies that have been introduced into some schools, along with the aeroseal seal or duct sealing ventilation improvements, are improving um, uh, the air quality. And that, when you look back at some of the slides, starts to translate into better learning opportunities for all the students. Why? Because we're uh, improving um, the airflow and reducing the amount of CO2 that's generated in, in the classrooms. Uh, the other thing too is that this is a long-term sustainable approach here. Um, we think it's better dollars spent than some of the uh, portable air technologies that have been introduced in the schools. I, I get how that works and, and perhaps why it was done, but I, I think there's some better dollars that could have been spent to improve uh, the systems within the school or even introduce some systems in the school that would bring in fresh air, which these portable units aren't doing. Next slide. Yeah, so that, that wraps up what I was um, talking about. And I think there's been quite a bit of information that's been shared for here. And I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Adam, who can maybe uh, steer some of the Q&A that might have come up and between myself and Josh and Kara. Hopefully we can answer some of your questions. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Tony and Josh and Kara. Um, that was that was really detailed, and we do have a, a lot of questions. Um, first, what I'd like to know is um, if this the the approach that uh, Tony just sort of walked us through um, is driven by. The, I mean, I know in this particular case with schools, it's driven by uh, the, the COVID-19 um, funding sort of from the government. Um, and I'm wondering who within that system is, is driving the upgrade? Is it the mechanical engineers? Is it the operations uh, management team? Um, sort of, you know, who's, who's organizing this uh, upgrade plan? I, I can start with that, uh, Adam, if, and then I'm certain Josh and perhaps Carol would join in. But what we're experiencing, uh, particularly with uh, many of my former colleagues in the role of facilities, is that the demand is coming from all sectors. You have, uh, in some cases, you have uh, teaching staff who have concerns about the air quality that are coming in there and uh, maybe perhaps demanding uh, a better understanding of how these systems work. You have parents who have a concern, needless to say, with uh, their, their uh, children being in these schools and whether these schools are meeting any particular ventilation standard. I, I, I think the uh, systems that were introduced, uh, funding that was introduced by the provincial government, particularly to put standalone HEPA fan units in the building, was uh, in somewhat uh, an approach to appease individuals or others who may have a concern but the truth is as you dig down into details uh, the functionality of, of those particular units as it relates to the amount of fresh air that may be in the room with the fact that 30 percent of the schools or so aren't even mechanically ventilated there's there's um, a lack of efficacy of those particular units that's really resolving some of the issues 
So I think there were, and, and you have facilities individuals who were realizing that there was an opportunity now to improve their ventilation. And when you started to dig down into some of the detail, we were finding uh, not only were some of the systems maybe not working, and the filtration probably wasn't the best, the ventilation system near the ductwork needed some overhaul and needed improvements because on, on average, we were seeing significant uh, leakage within that ductwork. And part of that is the design, uh, original designs. Part of it is just the ongoing maintenance and, and disruption of those systems over the years and um, going at it with a proper post to seal those gaps. Um, it was a, was a good way of improving the ventilation without any significant mechanical repairs or upgrades. Uh, and I think that that helped. So it came from a number of areas and perhaps Josh can maybe fine tune that. Yeah, I think I think really I'll just be short here, but I think really what it boils down to is is once you understand that not all of the airflow leaving your HVAC unit, whether it's on the roof, whether it's in a mechanical room, is actually making it to the spaces in the building, in a, in a building, school or otherwise, where people are actually breathing, you you start to realize there's a problem there, right? The, the ductwork was never intended to leak into the ceilings, the walls, the mechanical shafts and spaces. It's not. It wasn't engineered for that. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, sheet metal and, and duct ceiling has not been done very well typically in construction. And as Tony said, it almost has no relationship to building age. It, it almost uh, ultimately comes down to who was the contractor on that job and, and how uh, cognizant where they were. Or there are some organizations who have known about this problem for years and have been um, forcing their contractors to test this. But that's a very, very small number. So most people don't even realize that they have this issue. And once you expose that, why not make the systems on the building that already exist work better before we start to throw these portable carts everywhere, which may not be uh, sustainable or maintainable over the years. The HEPA, co the HEPA cost for HEPA filters alone is going to be a big budgetary line item as long as these school boards have to cover it. And uh, I don't suspect that's going to continue forever. Um, and, 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 I also, uh, and I also suspect that a lot of the HEPA filter carts are not properly sized for all classrooms. So uh, we have to we have to use supplementary measures as well. Okay, thanks, um, Kara. Would you do you have anything to add there? No, okay, I think well, we've covered it. Okay, we have a, a question directly for you, and it ties into another question that came in earlier. Um, so I'll just read this one verbatim, and then I'll let you answer that. And if I can tack on the other questions that are around it, we'll we'll try to do that. Um, Okay, it, it's known that warm air entering a space from the mechanical system rises and works well to make the user comfortable. Then the air rises and can be returned. Um, for air conditioning, what might be an approach uh, for distributing the cool air to the user, essentially because the warm air and cold air move opposite? It's an excellent question. So the nice thing about displacement ventilation is that it is particularly effective at air conditioning because it enters the space at a temperature that's colder than the rest of the, the building. So um, you sometimes have to add more air than is required strictly for breathing um, at the peak conditions. But frankly, for a lot of our schools that currently don't have air conditioning, even introducing just cool ventilation air at the bottom of the space would give you both uh, the, the best uh, ventilation effectiveness uh, and good uh, space thermal comfort because all of the cooling actually pools at the bottom of the space, which is where the students actually are. We don't need to air condition the top of the space. Uh, with that said, that um, ventilation effectiveness chart that I had showed that overhead distribution of cool air is reasonably effective. It's like the standard. Um, most of the air drops and mixes because it's cooler. Um, so you end up with a well-mixed space when you supply from the ceiling. So that answers the question. Okay, uh, it answered it for me, hopefully for the, the other questioners though. Um, so building on that, there's a couple of other questions that sort of are around this same sort of thing about displacement, ventilation. Um, you gave us some examples of retrofits that have done it. Um, so one question was, would it be possible or recommended um, to add existing ducts to sort of add ducts to existing ducts uh, to get them uh, down to floor level and then 
particularly about schools, uh, because you know anything in a school I think needs to be sort of more durable than a typical commercial office. Um, you know, they're uh, more sensitive to exposure to students. Um, so perhaps uh, both all, all three of you could add something to that. Um, you know, that particular challenge of adding an exposed duck for this improved displacement style. Um, oh, Tony, I'm sure has excellent uh, input on that, but the um, the gauge of metal you use has a lot to do with how well it will last over time. So mechanical engineers have a very good understanding of that. Some of us carry little gauge uh, measurers for our uh, construction of min work. Um, you can cover it with drywall at some additional expense. Um, you can buy covers uh, or, or you could use, you know, as I say, use a chunky gauge of metal. Um, but they do for sure sell school rated, which is to say made out of thick gauge metal uh, diffusers uh, for retrofit into classrooms. So, um, Tony, what, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, if, in thinking of a more uh, cost effective, straightforward way, if you have a, a taller, um, space, i.e. a gym, sometimes a library or otherwise, I think having a ceiling fan appropriately sized, and in some cases it has to be cased if it's in a gym, um, having a ceiling fan is the most uh, straightforward way of uh, bringing that warmer air down and, and actually circulating some of the air within there. A adding additional ductwork ha has, its, has its limitations. One is cost, then there's issues with um, the ability to bring down the right amount of flow and, and, and its appropriate locations and everything else. I, I've had limited uh, success with that and, and that wasn't one of the normal strategies I would take. Yeah, I, w I would say it's important to understand that is changing to displacement ventilation is a major retrofit. You should think of it as something that requires a mechanical engineer. It changes the amount of air that's required and the temperatures that are required. So the operating conditions for the unit serving the space need to be changed. Um, it is an engineered solution. It also requires a certain ceiling height. So ideally 10 feet, you can sort of make it work with nine, but 10 is better. Um, I obviously haven't sold Tony on it yet, but it is it is definitely a higher cost solution that should be considered as part of an upgrade and not something that you'd be uh, adding on an ad hoc basis. But definitely for new schools, right, Kara? Oh my God. <laughs> I, I haven't talked to an owner who uses displacement ventilation with any regrets yet. Um, and anyone I've talked to, any school board that has adopted it, it, it just talks about it as a matter of course. Um, it's, it's extremely effective at providing quality outcomes. Great. Um, we have another question again that is, is sort of a, a case study of a few other questions that came in earlier. So I'm going to use this. Um, maybe I'll ask this to Josh first. Um, so uh, this is uh, from Shauna. Uh, Greetings from snowy Manitoba. In reviewing the capacity of existing systems in uh, campus buildings, we were told that many of the ventilation systems cannot handle higher than MERV 8. Why would that be? And what options in, um, in our extreme climate should we be thinking about to try to achieve safe uh, indoor air quality to return to full capacity? Well, uh, yeah, MERV-8 is uh, as a filter rating these days is kind of unfortunate, right? I mean, if we're not at if we're not at MERV-13, we're we're not catching COVID with any kind of reliability um, or anything that resembles COVID, like the seasonal colds and flu. Uh, colds and flu. A, a lot of a lot of what you have to do in terms of the filtration, in terms of what you can use, is, is really based on the performance of the fan, right? What is the curve of the performance of that fan? What RPM was it designed to operate at? at what air flows with what static pressure, that, that's not a one variable equation, right? There, there, there's a bunch of variables that go on there. There's certainly the design rating, but then there's the actual implementation rating, which takes into account the filtration, the static pressure as a result of the duct work and the coils on the system and all those other types of pieces. Um, I'm not going to say that uh, what the, uh, I'm not gonna say that what the, uh, you know, your assessment said was wrong or incorrect, let's assume it is. Um, but certainly to get from a MERV-8 to a MERV-13 is not the biggest pressure increase. It's nowhere near compares to, uh, say, a MERV-13 to a HEPA. 
Um, so I, I would encourage to look at solutions such as uh, changing the pulleys on the fan, if that's an option, to increase its RPM uh, still safely within its range. Uh, and, but that might require also more horsepower out of the motor. So you, instead of needing, say, 20 horsepower, you might need a 25 horsepower motor to get that fan to operate where you need it to so that you don't impact the airflow uh, when you change your filtration. Uh, that being said, um, you know, what if, if you do just replace the MERV 8 with the MERV 13, you know, what is the expected real airflow impact? Is it is it 2%? Is it 5%? Is it 10% of the system capacity? That that really matters because you know if it's if it's a smaller number uh, and especially uh, as if you look at your ductwork infrastructure and realize how much leakage could be in your ductwork infrastructure already 20 30 or percent or more maybe the upgrade to a MERV 13 might take five percent off the total unit but you can recover that and more through other measures so so it's not it's not necessarily just a, a one off there are some different options to explore. Yeah. I I'll just jump in and add to that, uh, if I may, Adam. Um, one of the things from a facilities perspective, I would I would say to that individual ask that question is, you need to understand um, one that you pro you need a properly engineered solution. That is one thing, but there's some simple things that could be arranged to make sure that uh, the performance of the existing system can work. Whether that's uh, making sure that the filters and any reheat coils that you may be in the ductwork are have been cleaned and maintained for proper airflow, and as well, my guess is uh, if the building is a little bit older, it, there may need to be an air balancing uh, approach that's necessary in there. There's uh, many things that are in that ductwork, including dampers, fire dampers, and other things that uh, over the years uh, can cannot perform properly or, or be um, not performing at all. And affect the ventilation. And I, in my experience, even a lot of new buildings, there is a proper air balancing done to even start off the building in the right way. So there's some what I would call some system performance issues. It's like like that that analogy I brought up, or Peter Varga brought up about about the health of a person in the building. Sometimes you need to check the blood pressure, you know, and make sure everything's working properly first before you start throwing in medications and everything else. And that's often what has to happen. Some good old fashioned maintenance and checks on the system before you go in and do certain things because it really shouldn't be too problematic to go from MERV 8 to MERV 13. There will be some impact but it shouldn't be that much that somebody would say we can't do this. Yeah I, I want to emphasize that Tony's case studies were uh, really solid in terms of showing that if you are the owner of a air handling system that's moving 8500 cfm today it's possible only 6500 of that is getting to the classrooms in the first place and it's going to be very uneven i i've done similar work since covid where we found that the far branches of existing systems were getting 10 or 20 percent of their design airflow rates um, yeah, really horrifying. Um, that was all of the common areas, don't worry. Um, and so if you were to air seal and rebalance your ductwork, you might find that you're getting more fresh air to the space. So again, just using random numbers, if you, if you were a 10,000 CFM air handler, if you're only getting 7,000 there now, then adding the MERV 13 filters, maybe it drops by 15%, but you're still going to be putting more fresh air into the space than you were initially. Um, the other comment is if it's a mixed air handling unit um, and you're considering more fresh air, at least for getting back into the building, the pressure drop through the louver for the fresh air is much less than the whole return air system from the building. So increasing your amount of fresh air could potentially allow the fan to do the same amount of work and increase your outdoor air percentage. So, uh, you know, the limitation there is when it's very cold that your design day temperatures that that's going to create a temperature issue. But most of the shoulder season days, it's going to work really well. Very interesting. OK, uh, we have a, a couple of questions about this, but stepping back a little bit to the to the um, filters, what about filters that are um, not MERV rated, so smart filters that um, have sensors that tell you, you know, sort of how it's operating, and, um, but that are not MERV rated. Um, how do you, first of all, would you recommend those types of things? And how do you, um, how do you sort of 
manage something that is outside of this uh, regulatory structure that ASHRAE is using. I'll put Has that anyone else seen these? I'm not, I'm not familiar with um, anyone selling a filter who is trying, anyone reputable selling a filter that's trying to avoid the MERV rating process. So MERV is, is literally just a test strategy where they tell you each rating system has a threshold for three different particulate sizes. Um, and it sets up the standard testing conditions in those various different locations. So the electrostatic filters that I put on the screen in my presentation, um, they make some claims about the MERV rating of the filter when it's turned on and when it's turned off. Um, but they still are using the test standard as a basis for talking about the performance of their filter. Um, I, I would recommend using suppliers that are, are talking about their filters using MERV or HEPA. Um, and also anyone who um, it says HEPA-like or HEPA near HEPA or any of those like sort of wiggle words around HEPA, again, you want to ask really important those are still good filters, maybe, but as a commercial building owner with a health and safety obligation for your students, I think third-party testing and, and uh, certification is important. I mean, I would, I would say too that, look, there are filters out there that do not have a MERV rating, but they are the junkiest filters on the market. And, 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 you know, it, it's usually you don't have to look at the filter to see that it doesn't have a MERV, a MERV rating on it. You can just look at the filter itself and and just see these fiber media style filters, which honestly, uh, you know, you know, a lot of people use them in, say, rooftop units, uh, but they're really only designed to catch like leaves. Right. The, 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 you know, the, the, there's not there's not much else going on to them. They're super cheap. Um, you know, they're not but they're not effective at all. They never were. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that we should just be like systematically avoiding. If you can see through the filter, if you can get your finger through that filter, you, you know, fairly easily, uh, uh, trust me, it's not a pleated filter, which is kind of like that minimum standard for a conventional mirror to get some kind of performance out of it. Right. Okay. All right. On a, a, a different take on this, uh, it has been raised uh, in a couple of places. Um, so a question coming in about uh, germicidal UVC lighting and how it can be used uh, to best improve indoor air quality. Uh, can it reduce um, air filtration requirements? And are there any associated ozone risks? Um, and any other comments about UV for um, indoor air quality? You wanna start on that one, Kara? Sure. Uh, so the reason that we really focused on filtration in this presentation is the place where every uh, panelist agrees and in fact where all of the certifi certifying and, and rating bodies agree. So if you go to the CDC and ASHRAE and um, there's one more um, that, that sort of are all trying to come to a single place where they are sure about the best way to do things, filters have a known performance and they have very few application concerns. UVC has um, known performance. It definitely kills things, um, particularly in, in long residence times when the light has uh, lots of time to treat the thing that it's shining on. One of the concerns in application in HVAC is that you need a very high intensity light if you're putting it into a air handler because the residence time is very short, doesn't have a very long time to shine on things. The, the UVC has to stay clean, so you have to have a way of making sure that it continues to have the same intensity and in maintaining the bulbs. Um, and there's less evidence compared to filtration um, that, uh, that you're gonna get that long-term performance. Um, there are definitely certifying bodies that will confirm that a specific UVC uh, technology is ozone free. But when I was looking for that certification on UVC lights for a, a project where we wanted them just as an extra layer of protection after filtration, which we'd upgraded, um, it was very hard to find people who'd gone through the UL certification for ozone free. Um, 
so uh, Energy Star will also do ozone-free certification on the small, like in-room units. Um, so, so it's you know it's safe, it's effective. It does need an ozone ozone-free certification, which are available, but not very many people are using them. Um, but if you have only a limited amount of money to spend, uh, please spend it on getting more fresh air to students before you spend it on UVC lights. All right, Tony, Josh. Yeah, I mean, UVC and ductwork, UVC in upper rooms, uh, UVC in standalone boxes on the floor, like as Kara said, there's, there's no doubt that uh, you know, proper exposure of air to a, a certain level of UV light with a certain amount of residence times, you know, kills things, right? That's why we don't stare directly into UV lights because they actually burn our eyes, right? They, they, they do have that sanitizing effect, but it has to be, a, you know, it has to be down on the tertiary measure side um, be, be, because like we said, fresh air and filtration uh, and, and keeping air moving, it, it just, it has to, and, and humidity, let's, let's not, you know, forget about humidity too. I mean, given the choice between UVC lights or controlling the humidity in the building, I know which one Kara is going to pick and, and probably Tony as well. So like there's, there's, there's simply just better places to spend your money unless you've got an unlimited uh, pit, then, you know, it's time to look at it, but certainly no ozone, like any, any air cleaner system, uh, that's UVC based or 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 other types of uh, ionic air cleaners. Anything that has doesn't have a zero ozone certification, stay stay away because uh, ozone is an indoor air contaminant. Uh, we don't want to be creating that in our spaces. Yeah, and I'll just add to that if I may, Adam. Uh, from a facilities perspective, uh, anytime you introduce another layer of technology, however well intended, it's another uh, cost ongoing operational costs. It's also an ongoing training issue for individuals who need to understand what this is. And there's also the need to understand that this technology isn't lifelong. There's, there's UV lights like any other light burn out. There needs to be some performance metrics that are introduced. Everyone needs to know that. And I think you'll, many people will find uh, that it will be an expensive process to go through if if any any particular performance metrics aren't uh, quantified and that's the challenge. We're not, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's another layer of technology. And, uh, there's a cost to go with that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for those uh, detailed uh, responses. Um, we are rapidly running out of time. We have about three minutes left, and I'm wondering. There's one other topic that's been raised in a few different questions. I'm hoping you can speak to it quickly. Um, maybe if everyone has one comment about it. Um, there, a, a lot of the changes that you've been discussing change the, the humidity level. What sort of considerations do we need to take into account for the building envelope, for the, the, you know, the structures in the building, for how the building interior is going to work if we change those humidity? Let's maybe start with Josh. Um, yeah, Kara might have a little bit more detailed answer than me. I mean, certainly, certainly, um, it, uh, the humidity impact in a building comes in two ways, right? It's a combination of the fresh air that we're bringing in um, to the building is impacting the humidity, but it is also a combination of the infiltration of the building envelope. So now, certainly with new buildings, um, all new buildings that we construct, we should be we should be making them airtight as best as possible. If we look at the standards for building performance, the Passive House standard, where the Toronto Green standard is going, the BC Step Code, all of those standards by 2030 really rely, well, Passive House today already relies on it, on having an airtight building on And that's for a lot of reasons, energy performance, indoor air quality, control of condensation, control of humidity, just it, it is the way that, that buildings are being constructed today and will be almost universally constructed in, into the future. But but ult ultimately, it's that 40 to 60% relative humidity range. Really, if we can do better, 40 to 50%, because there is some evidence that upwards of 50% RH in a building, there's a slight increased risk of mold growth. Uh, and, and certainly once you get above 60%, that becomes much worse. Um, but but keeping keeping that range is, is so important and, and we, just don't do a good job of that uh, in most buildings. Uh, the, to be perfectly honest, where I'm sitting here right now, uh, the RH is about 15%, and, and that and that is what it is because of the way the mechanical system is designed, and it's a very typical uh, kind of implementation. So 
you know, this is something that's been left out, but it, it is so important. And it, and it, you know what, it, the effects of it extend beyond just the people in the building themselves, although that should always be our prime focus in our just society. Uh, it also extends to the life of the building and the building materials, right? Uh, it, you know, keeping a building at proper humidity levels also contributes to increasing the longevity of that building, the, the uh, sealants, the caulkings, and, and all, a lot of other things in the building that are impacted by either very high or very low humidity levels. So there's just a really, really lot of good reasons that we should be focusing on that. Okay, really quick, uh, the AeroSeal technology we discussed for ducts can actually be used for buildings too. So I've seen buildings where, uh, office buildings, humidified to 40% RH, when they turned it off, within an hour and a half, the building was back down at outdoor humidity levels, like seven to 10%. That's an indication you have air leakage problems. That humidity is leaking through the building envelope, which means that there are going to be potentials for mold. Um, although it will have a chance to dry out overnight because you're only operating 12 hours a day, nonetheless, that gives you an indication you need to seal your building to be able to keep that humidity in. Um, second thing, you can obviously tune the humidity using a building control strategy so that you add less humidity when it's very cold out. If you find that your windows um, are not high performance enough to keep from having condensation on them. So again, this is a strategy where at the worst case days, you might have to turn it down a little bit, but for the most part, you'll, you'll be dialing into the best you can do without having problems with your building envelope because that cold interior surface will cause condensation. Yeah, and just a quick piece from a facility's point of view, it's relatively inexpensive to uh, sample some of the humidity within a building. So quantify it before you take any measure. It's not hard to do, very inexpensive. Try that out in a few rooms in a particular building. Give yourself a sense of a baseline to work from and then see an engineering group to help you get an engineered solution to how you might improve that. I, I did mention humidity and ERVs, but I want to emphasize again, if you're investing in technology, the ERV will save you heating costs, but also recycle humidity back into the building passively without introducing a maintainable element. So that's also a good first thing to look at. Brilliant advice all around. Thank you. Uh, this, we are already a minute over. Uh, I, so we're going to have to wrap here. I, we have enough questions. We could probably go on for another couple hours. But uh, <laughs> I want to thank you all, Tony, Josh, and Kara. Thank you so much on behalf of Sustainable Buildings Canada for putting together this webinar for us um, and delivering it so well uh, and giving us uh, your time uh, today um, to answer all these questions. Um, I see there's still more questions coming in. Um, I want to um, remind everyone that you're going to receive a recording of this uh, webinar and also uh, the slide decks and contact information for our three presenters today. Um, and hopefully they will not mind if you reach out to them and ask them these questions all. directly. Uh, yeah, so, free. <laughs> perfect. Uh, with that, we're going to have to wrap. Thank you all again for presenting and thank you um, everyone for attending. Uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar on uh, tiny homes and accessory dwelling units in March. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.